So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Let him do it. You don't have enough of one of me? Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. If you stop eating, your body dies. If you stop reading, your spiritual life is going to be shriveled up. You're saved, but you will not be effective for the Lord. I want to thank you, Pat, that I'm giving Bible study tonight. So I will officially welcome everybody to Bible study tonight. So when somebody gets saved, there's a natural hunger and thirst to get to know God more. There's just a desire, a great desire to know who he is, what he is, how he is, and you just got these million and six questions in you. The first step in salvation is to understand and realize your state before God and then receiving God's gift of salvation by grace through faith. At this point, you'll notice that your hunger to want to get to know God more will increase as the seconds go by. And I'm saying this out of experience. And I've seen this in many, many people that truly got saved. And over the years, you know that they got saved because you see where they're at today. So the beginning steps for you are to learn the basic doctrines of the Bible. As these doctrinal foundations are slowly being laid, your communication with God already started the second that you turned to Him, confessing Jesus Christ. That was your first prayer officially to God, that God heard and God gave you the gift of salvation. This communication slash prayer will continue until God calls you home. The next foundational spiritual pillar to lay down in your heart and in your mind is going to be the daily reading of God's Word. This will play a major and pivotal part and role in your spiritual growth. That is going to be your main IV in your veins. A preliminary question that people have is this, how do I know that the Bible is the Word of God or how can I trust it? Now that's a very valid question because everybody asks this question. I asked the question back in May of 1985. It's important to know if the Bible is God's Word or not. Because reading the Bible with a conviction that the Bible is God's Word will profoundly influence your spiritual growth and your walk in the Lord. Example, you receive a memo from your boss knowing it's authentic. You'll take whatever information is on that note seriously. If you think it's a prank from your co-workers, you'll read it without putting any attention to it. So it is with the Bible. So if you visit our YouTube channel and navigate the playlist tab, you'll find a series that we created titled, Who Wrote the Bible, God or Man. Take the time to watch these videos as they will significantly deepen and strengthen your faith in who wrote the Bible. Knowing God is the author of the Bible, your reading will take on a profound and transformative dimension. Why read the Bible every day? Let me ask you this question differently. Why do you eat? I think the answer is obvious. Food sustains your fleshly carnal bodies and all of its functions. Reading the Bible on a daily basis is basically the same thing. It will sustain your spiritual functions functions like establishing a solid prayer connection between you and your God, moral and ethical guidance, personal growth of your inner man, transformation of your mind and winning the war against your flesh or maybe walking in the spirit and you got a list of other things. That's why it's important for you to read every day. As eating is vital to your body, so is reading your Bible vital to your spirit. If you stop eating, your body dies. If you stop reading, your spiritual life is going to be shriveled up. You're saved, but you will not be effective for the Lord. Jesus emphasizes the importance of not only eating your daily portion of bread, but living our lives off of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. He wants you to add something to this. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And the words that proceeded out of the mouth of God, you have it sitting on your lap or on the table in front of you. This statement underscores the significance of spiritual nourishment and guidance derived from a deep and continual engagement with the teachings, the wisdom, and the knowledge and understanding found in God's Word. Now, what are the benefits? Benefits of reading the Bible every day. The main primary benefit of reading your Bible will be a deepened and strengthened relationship between you and your God. The massive piece of that foundation is going to get that relationship between you and the Lord so solid that nobody will be able to break it. Any relationship, that is husbands, wives, boyfriend, girlfriends, parent, child, co-workers, friends, whatever it is, is deepened and strengthened when both parties get to know one another. 
They get to know the boundaries that they have to stay within. Now these are lines not to be crossed. Example, you get to know someone. The more you get to know them, the more the relationship is going to deepen. So if you value that particular relationship, there are certain lines that you will not cross because of the respect that you have towards that person. Not to jeopardize your relationship. Again, if you really value that relationship, you won't cross that line. Example, if they don't like certain actions that you do for the preservation and harmony of that particular relationship, you won't do that action in their presence. This is respecting and nurturing the relationship. And any relationship is based on this also. So there has to be an open communication between both parties. If one doesn't properly communicate to the other their wants and their needs, there's a breakdown in that particular relationship. In your relationship with God, He already knows you. So that part of the relationship is already taken care of. And for your relationship to be complete in Him, you have to get to know Him now, through and through. God already has a head start on you because He knows who you are. So by reading His Word, He reveals Himself to you. The greater your understanding of Him, the more profound and intimate your relationship between you and Him becomes. This in turn fosters an increasing sense of awe and respect for God, especially when you get to know Him through the pages of Scripture. He is an incredible being. The love that He has for us is incredible. The justice that He has, the Lord is amazing. My fear of the Lord my God that I have towards Him, or let me say it in other words, my awe and deep respect that I have between me and the Lord, I will stay within His boundaries, not only because they keep me safe, but because I truly love Him. In a dance partner, it takes two to dance the tango. If one decides to misstep, if one decides to slack off, all of a sudden, you just broke the stride. It takes two to dance. So love, in its different capacities, is the glue to any relationship. When that love wanes, that is, it decreases or fails, that relationship starts falling apart and eventually will fall apart. So by reading, you get to know who God is. What are His boundaries? What's He like? What doesn't He like? What does He love? What does He hate? What does He want from us? What does He expect from us? Here's a few examples. Turn to Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips is an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. They that deal truly, they that deal sincerely, honestly, faithfully, are His delight. That's what God is looking for. So God delights in sincerity and honesty. A quality that's quickly fading from mankind. There's less and less people being honest and being sincere. If you have that honesty and sincerity, my advice to you is keep doing it. Even people look at you stupid or crazy or whatever it is, you keep walking in that way. Because I truly value the intimate relationship that I have between me and my God, my dealings will be in sincerity and in honesty before Him, above all else, and before men. Because if I'm honest and sincere with my fellow man, I am respecting God, and it's me being sincere and honest between me and the Lord my God. So let's look at another example. Proverbs chapter 15, we'll start reading in verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is His delight. Did you get that? The prayer of the upright is His delight. Now God delights in the believer's prayer. Now the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. And this suggests that when people with wicked or morally corrupt intentions offer sacrifices to God, their actions are detestable in His sight. Example, an insincere or a hypocritical offering where people perform religious rituals without genuine repentance or a transformed heart. You know the type. A prayer asking God, for example, to heal someone, and if God does, that person will go to church. You know, somebody's sick in a hospital. Oh God, if you can heal them, I'm going to go to church. And what happens when they get healed? You see these people in church. When that prayer is answered, what was promised to get done doesn't by the guy that actually said that. Or he goes to church, but he's sitting there looking secretly at his watch because he just wants to get the hell out of there. That's hypocritical. That's an abomination to the Lord. The Lord's looking on your heart. What does it say in Jeremiah 17, 9? The heart is desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the hearts. He searches the heart. He knows what's in your heart. You think that you're going to take God for a fool? It ain't happening. So the key aspect is the lack of righteousness and sincerity in the motives behind the sacrifice. You did something for me. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to go to church. But you're sitting there and you really don't want to be there. What was your motive? And that makes it unacceptable to God. Look at verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but He heareth the prayers of the righteous. What does God expect? 
Turn with me now to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. And now Israel, I want you to take the word Israel there, I want you to take the spiritual application of this verse and put your name there. I'm going to put my name in there. And now Frank, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. So turn with me now to Mark chapter 12, we'll start reading in verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and this is the first commandment. If you notice, God wants you completely, your whole being, your whole body, soul, and spirit. When he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, he's asking that all of your being, okay, Lord, I'm given to you. Look at verse 31. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. You follow these two commandments, you basically just took care of the Old Testament. So by you reading the Bible, you're going to start reading verses like this. And you're going to start noticing what the Lord likes, what He doesn't like, what He wants, what He doesn't want. He's going to show you the Bible is a mirror. As you're going to keep reading, He's going to show you who and what you are. So here you are, you're daily reading your Bible, and you come across Proverbs 8.13. Here you're going to come to see what God hates. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. Now because I'm speaking of myself, because I deeply respect the Lord my God, when I see pride, arrogancy, when I see the evil way or a forward mouth, I will truly hate it in me. I'm not looking at it for other people. I got my own problems. I don't need to deal with you. And I'm not going to be looking at the other guy. Now, if the other guy wants to deeply respect the Lord like I'm deeply respecting the Lord, let him hate his own pride, arrogancy, and the evil way in a forward mouth. That's in him. That's what the verse is saying. So for the sake of my relationship between me and the Lord, I will change my ways to please Him. If I have pride, I have arrogancy, I have an evil way, speech, or whatever it is in my life, because I value the relationship, I will put that behind me. Because even though I live in pride and arrogancy or whatever else it is, eventually that road, you're going to be coming in at 250 miles an hour and you're headed straight for that wall. And believe me, they're going to need a scrape to take you off of that wall. That's called a mean trip. So before the Lord is going to get me plastered on a wall, I says, you know what, Lord? Help me to take care of this pride, this arrogancy, this evil way, deceitfulness in my mouth, lying, cheating, gossip, whatever it is. I want you to help me. And this sanctification is going to be done a little bit every day. Now, by doing this, taking care of my pride, arrogancy, the evil way, forward mouth, the byproduct of this happening is me becoming a better person in the eyes of my neighbor. Because I value my relationship, I'm cleaning up my act because of me and the Lord. All of a sudden now, I'm naturally becoming a better person to my neighbor. God wants me, He wants you to give your heart completely to the Lord. And by you reading on a daily basis, He will teach you a little bit every day. My father once told me many years ago, if you want to fill up a glass, you fill it one drop at a time. Hey, by the time you're done, he goes, in life, people have reached 99, 105, and 110 years old. And it was this one guy at 110. He goes, I feel bad dying. He goes, yeah. He goes, no, you don't understand. There's so much more things I wanted to learn. But at the age that he had reached, he was taking a drop of information a drop of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding every day of his life. This guy was a smart cookie. So, in eradicating pride, arrogancy, and evil way, I automatically become a better person to the person next to me. Because you know that pride and arrogancy, the evil way, having a deceitful mouth, lying, cheating, is despicable in the eyes of the people. When somebody truly loves the Lord and they've got the nose in the book, you're gonna be a better person. The Word is like water. It's going to wash you, and it's gonna wash you a little bit every day. I'll give you this example. You have a child, he's three, four years old. You're calling him in the house. By the time he gets in, he already played in the mud. So he is a piece of mud from the tip of his hairs to the soles of his feet. And the mom is going, oh boy. What's the first thing that she does? With her two fingers, she just wipes out the eyes. At least now you can see. And that's what happens when you get saved. You're coming in a piece of filth. So he opens your eyes. Let's start washing the hands. Let me start washing your face. Let me take off your dirty clothes. Let me put on new clothes. But before we put on the new clothes, the new clean clothes, I'm going to take you and I'm going to give you a bath. And now you start scrubbing all of that dirt out of the hair and the ears and the nose and the mouth and everywhere else. So by the time he gets out of the water, the water is black, but he's squeaky clean. You put on the new clothes. By the time you take him, from the time he comes in through the door, and by the time you put him the clean clothes, it might be a couple of hours. 
words. When you come to the Lord as dirty as you are, what's happening? He's taking you from the moment that you get saved. I was 23 when I got saved. And even 38 years later, there's still a lot of stuff to clean. And by the time he's going to call me home, there's still going to be stuff that he has to clean in my life. So by me reading the word every day, he's always saying, Frank, I want you to take care of this. I want you to eradicate this. I want you to start incorporating this in your life. But if you don't read, you won't know. And don't forget, it's a relationship between you and your God. And if you don't give a shit, he doesn't give a shit. He says, go do what you have to do because what's going to happen? One of these days you have a judgment that you have to go through. And that judgment, he says, I warned you, but you wanted to go your way. I don't have a problem with that. Go. But know that one of these days you're going to have to answer to every thought, every word, and every deed that basically your body produced. And then what? For five seconds of pleasure? Think, man. Think. As relationships are enriched through the process of getting to know one another on a deeper personal level, bonds are strengthened and the foundation of trust is established. And this is especially true of the Lord. What are the reasons for incorporating daily Bible reading into your life? What advantage is it going to give to you and in your life? So reading God's Word will provide guidance and wisdom for daily living. I want you to turn to Psalm 119 and verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I repeat, the word is a lamp unto my feet, not my neighbor's feet. That's why it's important for you to read every day because that word all of a sudden is going to become a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Ever notice when you're driving at night, the headlights usually are going to give you, let's say on a car, 10, 15, 20 feet in front of you. But you can't see 50 feet, 100 feet, or 300 feet in front of you. You don't need to see that far. So as you're driving, the road is getting cleared out so you know if you have to stay straight, turn left, turn right, whatever it is, however the road is going. When you have a lamp, that lamp is only going to shine about 3, 4 feet in front of you. As you take the next step, the light shines for your next step. So you will never outstep the light circle that you're actually in. When you go forward, it goes. When you stay, it stays. Memorize this verse. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet because I'm reading, I'm meditating, and I'm studying it. And the light unto my path. No matter where you may walk under God's creation, if God's word is not a lamp to your feet, and a light to your path, you are walking in total darkness. Oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Really? You keep walking that way. If ever you need help for you to get peeled off that wall, you give me a call and I'm going to see what I can do for you. Just to be clear, walking in darkness signifies living a life without the guidance, principles, or values that come from a source of moral or spiritual light. You think you have your life under control. How many people crumble? How many people get to the end of their lives? I wish I would have done it differently. I'm telling you now, now's the time to change. You go to the Lord your God. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow because you don't know if you're going to be waking up tomorrow morning. You don't know in the next five seconds if you're not going to drop dead. Once you're on the other side, everybody believes. Darkness is associated with ignorance, sin, or lack of righteousness, while light represents wisdom, goodness, and divine guidance. What divine guidance do you have? That you're feeding your flesh because you're in the world. You know what? I tell you, get out of the world, because eventually the world is going to take about the left cheek, it's just going to rip it out, and it doesn't care about you. That's what you need to understand. Therefore, walking in darkness suggests living in a state of moral confusion, spiritual ignorance, or separation from positive and guiding influences. It refers to being disconnected or distant from sources of guidance, support, or positive influences in one's life. People have the opportunity to have a good guiding influence in their life and they say, no thank you. No skin off my back. It implies a state where individuals lack access to factors that can provide clear direction, genuine encouragement, or a moral or beneficial framework. But you said, no thank you. At the bottom of your barrel or splashed out against the wall, at one point that's where some people grow their brains. And some people, even at that point, they say, I want nothing to do with you. The Lord help your soul. This separation could only result from various factors. So why are you still in the state that you're in? And there's a few factors, including the absence of positive role models in your life. Either because you push them away, or because you're not looking for them, or because you just turned around that you just didn't want to know that. Before saying no, go taste. Because the Bible does say, taste and see that the Lord is good. How many people say that the Lord is no good? But taste and see that the Lord is good. And then you're going to come to the same conclusions I've come to. So getting back, 
You have the absence of positive role models in your life, a lack of moral or ethical guidance, or you distancing yourself from supportive relationships. You just separated yourself from a relationship that actually could have helped you. Teachings or principles that contribute to your personal growth and well-being. How many situations have I seen over the years where people had the opportunity and they said no thank you? And then some of them I had the opportunity to know how their lives ended off? Not good. So in the context of walking in darkness, it suggests living without the positive guidance that helps navigate through life's challenges and make morally sound decisions. Psalm 18 verse 28. For thou, speaking of the Lord, wilt light my candle. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. Everybody is living in darkness. Even believers are living in darkness. Even though I've been walking with the Lord for 38 years, there are many times I'm doing things, my mind is just darkened. And I keep asking for the Lord to lighten my way, my life, my mind, my consciousness. Even as believers, we're walking in that darkness. We can accept, we can reject. Lord, I want you to light my candle that you can take me out of my darkness. So why don't you ask the Lord for him to light your candle so you can get out of your darkness. What else? Reading God's word will give you light and understanding. I want you to turn to Psalm 119 and verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. The word entrance is used to convey the idea of the coming in or introduction of God's words. When God's words enter into a person's life or consciousness, they bring illumination. It opens your mind and understanding, particularly to those who may be considered simple or just simply lack understanding. God will give you that understanding. In simpler terms, the verse is expressing the transformative power of God's words. The arrival or reception of these words into your heart and mind is portrayed as a source of light and insight especially to those who may be humble, open, and seeking understanding. When you start reading the word, being humble, open, and seeking, Lord, I want you to make me to understand. You watch what's going to happen to your reading. You watch how all of a sudden words are going to start popping off that page. The Lord is incredible. You approach that word, God, talk to me. Reading God's word will transform your mind. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So an example of renewing your mind is found in Colossians chapter 3. We'll start reading in verse 9. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man, the old man that came from the world. He used to lie all kinds. Now that you're walking with the Lord, there's a relationship between you and the Lord. He doesn't like you lying. So what do you do? God, through Paul, he writes, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man. The old man, this is what he used to do with his deeds. In verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Reading God's word will increase and strengthen your faith. And this is found in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Reading God's word will cleanse the way you are walking in, meaning it will cleanse the way you are currently living your life for the better. Where are you going to see this? In Psalm 119 and verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Simple enough. Another word for wherewithal is resources. Got this from vocabulary.com. So the question is, with what resources shall a young man cleanse his way? The answer is given right after. It says, by taking heed according to thy word, according to God's word. So by minding, by listening, by observing, following the directives of God's words to you. So by paying close attention and following God's word, that's how you're going to clean your life. That's how you're going to clean your way. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You'll find that in Proverbs. A saved person can be walking on away, and the minute you start deviating from the Lord, you stop reading, stop praying, whatever, you start taking less desired paths. And eventually that's going to come back and bite you. And people that have sort of like left away a little bit, they know what I'm talking about. I've already been there, done that. It's really ugly. What else? Reading God's word will keep you sinless. Look at what it says in Psalm 119 verse 11, a couple of verses down. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. By you reading the word, by you hiding, memorizing his word, you will not sin against God. 
Yeah, but that's impossible. You know why you're saying it's impossible? Because you want to give in to your flesh. The flesh says, I want the drugs. I want the food. I want the alcohol. I want my candies. I want my chocolate. I want the women. I want whatever it is that your body is craving for. And that's why you're saying it's impossible. But if you truly, truly want to walk with the Lord and there's a relationship truly established between you and your God, yes, we're going to fall. Yes, I fall. But as much as possible, Lord, please help me walk with you. So reading God's Word will keep you sinless if God's Word is in your heart and you're a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. Reading God's Word will sanctify you. You'll find this in John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Reading God's Word will teach you or give you spiritual guidance. And you'll find this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. That means you're going to get a profit from it for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let me break it down for you. Doctrine. God's word will teach you about God's truths and his principles. What is reproof? His word will show you where you're wrong and where he corrects your wrongs and your mistakes. His word will guide you back into the right path if you've strayed, if you've derailed, he'll bring you back. Instruction in righteousness. God's word will teach you how to live a rightly and godly life according to God's standards. If you live your life according to God's standards, you're going to have full peace in your life, full joy, full happiness in your life. Yeah, 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 I got all these rules and regulations to remember. Well, look at your life right now. It's already in the shambles. I mean, give this a chance, no? So by you walking in that way, your neighbor looks at you and says, you know what, I like this guy or I like this woman. Your character is really deep. But where are the roots coming from? The roots are actually in the Bible. The person, a true Christian that's standing on the Bible, they will never move off of it. You know why? Their feet, they're rooted in those words. They can never go wrong. God will never steer you wrong. Reading God's Word will comfort and reassure you. If you read your Bible on a daily basis, you're going to read Isaiah 41.10. You know what it says? Fear thy not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. What about reading God's Word? What else are you going to get? You're going to get peace through the promises that God gives you. Go to John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, Jesus speaking. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. If you're in the world, what kind of peace do you have? Have you ever tested it against Jesus' peace? Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. People that commit suicide have no hope. Turn to the Lord and see what's going to happen to your life. It will turn around. The God of hope will give you hope to keep going on, to keep trekking on, and to do whatever it is that you need to get done. And He's going to fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. But you're reading the Bible daily, you're going to come across a verse in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. Thou, speaking of the Lord, will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Because I trust in the Lord, the peace that he gives me, it's a peace which passes all understanding. You have to experience it for yourself. Reading God's word will give you encouragement during challenging times and trials. Turn with me now to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What about Psalm 27, 14? Wait on the Lord. How many times have I prayed and the Lord wasn't answering? And he was just saying, wait, now is not the time. Wait, now is not the time. And then eventually when the time came, the Lord would answer. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. I had to fall on this verse many, many times, and the Lord came through for me many, many times. Let's look at another one. Reading God's Word, what will it do for you? You'll discover God's help 
in your life. In Psalm 46 1 it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When trouble comes, now what? What do I do? And you keep reading, daily reading. You come to Psalm 55 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. Whatever problems you're going through, it's a heavy burden on your shoulders. But what's the Lord saying? Cast your burden upon the Lord. And as you keep walking with the Lord, you're going to learn how to unload your burden on the Lord. And He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Reading God's Word will give you much, much more than the few things, a few points that I've pointed out here. He'll give you so much more, His promises to you, the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you will be receiving. You will find hope, you will find blessings. The Bible is a treasure box. The more you open it, the more you read, the more you meditate, the more you study it, the stuff that you will be mining out of it is mind-blowing. Last thought, when you approach the Bible to read it, treat God's Word as a spiritual guide. Before delving into its pages, pray for guidance and pray for instructions. Ask for your eyes to be opened to God's truths and the lessons meant for you to learn at that particular moment. The Bible is a spiritual book. You'll find this in 1 Corinthians, the end of chapter 2, the beginning of 3. The Bible is a spiritual book, and only the Holy Ghost can actually open your eyes to that. So when you take that book and says, I'm planning to read, meditate, or study, before you open the book, the first, first thing, the words that have to be coming out of your mouth, Lord, open my eyes, make me to behold wondrous things out of thy law. So only God can open your eyes and give you the understanding of it. As David asked of God in Psalm 119 verse 18, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. This is what you're supposed to be praying before you open the cover to get to the index. You pray, say, Lord, open my eyes. What do I need to learn today? And that devotion, that portion that you're going to be reading, God will be speaking to you. Any person can open and read the Bible, but only those that truly seek God, who ask, will God reveal the treasures of His Word to them. I know my state before you, I need for you to help me. As I open your Word, let your Word wash me clean, sanctify me at this point. What do I need to learn? What's my next step? When you approach the Bible, when you approach the Scriptures, God's Word like that, all of a sudden God's going to start opening His Word to you. So you have God up here and you're down here. So you've got prayer and you have His Word. I speak to God through prayer. God speaks to me through His Word. Once you understand this circle and you don't break it, you watch what's going to happen to your life. People have asked me the question, when I pray, who do I pray to? Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, do I pray to the Father? You pray to the Father in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Ghost. That's how that works. That's how they are one. For those of you that want to get to know God, I just want you to watch this video. And that's going to lead you to the Lord. And that's going to be your first step. And for the rest of us, may the Lord keep us till next week. May He bless us. I heard one preacher say this many years ago, here, there, or in the air. And if we don't meet next week, that means we've been raptured out of here. So guys, have yourselves a good week. We'll see each other next week, Lord willing.